So welcome everyone to the May to the April 4th, 2024 meeting of the Hyperledger Supply Chain and Trade Finance SIG. Today we are very lucky to have Meryl Sengol of the T3I Partner Network coming to speak with us. And I want to start the meeting by going over some Hyperledger uh, housekeeping. Hyperledger is a is committed to creating a safe and welcoming community for all people. And up on the wiki for today's meeting, there is a Hyperledger code of conduct. You're welcome to click through there to learn more if you would like. Also, um, as this is a public forum, we have the antitrust policy notice. The long and short of it is this information is this meeting is an open meeting and the recording will be available to all. So please don't share any any non-public information here because we want to make sure that uh, that this information can be shared. We have some exciting events coming up. Um, in the world of blockchain and trade finance, the Linux Foundation is having their open source summit later this month. At our next meeting, at our next SIG meeting, we're going to, going to be doing some project planning. Then we're going to, on May 2nd, we're going to be having Bobby Mascara from The Giving Chain present on how they are using NFTs. In May, we're going to hear from Alexander Style of Ventoris. SIG member Ned Thompson was able to connect with him and, and invite him. And then in June, the FreightWaves Future of Supply Chain conference is going to be taking place in Atlanta. So at our next SIG meeting on April 18th, we're going to be talking about our new blog. We've already planned the first two installments. Jeff and Tom are, are focused on working on the first. I'm going to be working on the second one, but we're going to speak more about that and talk about other ways to get involved. Please bring any ideas for your blog posts and anything you want to read, anything you want to create. And then also, um, am I still? Yes, am I still on Zoom? And then today, our, our big event, we have Meryl Sengos. She's going to present on the digitization of trade and trade finance in Turkey, blockchain for export transactions and economic impact of the UN model law on electronic transferable records. So I'm going to stop sharing now. Uh, no, I'm gonna stop sharing. And Meryl, would you like to, Meryl, the meeting is now yours. The floor is now yours. Thank you very much for this introduction. Nice to see you, e meet you, and uh, thank you very much for everybody to coming here. I'm sharing my screen now. Um, Do you see my screen without my notes? I don't not know. yet. Not yet. Okay. Okay. How about now? Now we can see your your slide and the notes. Okay, I will try. I don't want to uh, show my nose, so I will stop share and one more time I will try. Thank you for your patience. I will do it. Now, how is it? Do you see my notes? <laughs> we can still see the notes, yes. Yes, yes. No. What you should have done is you change to PowerPoint slides. Okay. Then you share the PowerPoint slides. First presenter view. Yes, PowerPoint slides. Then share will... the share the slides. Don't share the presenter slide. Yes, I'm doing this uh, mistake always, guy. Now I can. Yes, read. perfect. 
<laughs> Thank you, Zulkifli, very Thank much. You. I'm learning from you. Uh, we are talking about technology, but as it is seen, I'm not good in <laughs> technology too. <laughs> okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, I would like to start by talking about who am I and what I do now. I have a, um, 25 years of experience in banking, fintech and government sectors. I was a senior executive at Ishbank, which is one of the largest bank in Turkey. And I work in trade finance, cross-border transactions and commercial loan banking areas. Uh, and I had a, a lot of dig digitalization experience in my banking career, but one of them is very special for me, which is blockchain-based implementation of payment commitment product of Marco Polo Network. Uh, I left my banking career in 2021, and I work as a consultant for first the Marco Polo Network, then uh, for Contour Trade Network. Now I am partner of T3I, network and we just completed a project on adoption of litter in Turkey for the Ministry of Trade and EBRD. Uh, for uh, who may not know, uh, T3I is a partner network and uh, a global collective of industrial leading specialists in trade, treasury and technology with the focus of uh, digital innovation. Now we are largest uh, international advisory network with more than 40 specialists around the world with deep expertise. And one of the, our expertise area is military, uh, you know, CITRAS, ICCs, World Trade Organizations documents. Uh, I would like to first of all talk about last year's key developments which has which a lot of things happened uh, last year really uh, first of all uh, i would like to talk about uk's etta uh, last year the uk approved the electronic trade document act etta in september the etta plays a pivotal foundation for advancement of digital trade ETA facilitates the transformation of essential trade and trade finance documents into digital assets. <laughs> I'm saying this again, it is digital assets, uh, door. The act uh, primarily includes bill of sledding, bill of exchange and promissory notes. And according to ETA, trade records are equivalent to the papers under determined conditions. As it is known, the vast majority of the international trade contracts in the supply chain world are signed by, under UK law. So this reform is very important for the digitization of trade and trade finance industry. UK's ETA aligns with United Nations model law on electronic transferable records. I will say after that as military. Uh, Military, uh, prior to UK, six other countries had already adopted laws in line with the military and several other countries, including India, Turkey, China and Japan, have shown keen interest in the military and are actively studying its potential. Additionally, some countries like Germany, France and the USA are the advanced level of the adoption of this uh, military. Uh, the second development of the last year is uh, decrease in the presence of blockchain fintech companies. I would like to focus on and talk about three key blockchain fintech companies from the world of logistic and trade finance that have collapsed in the last year or so. The first one is trade trade lens. Uh, this is the my this was the, my favorite indeed, and I was very ups, upset from um, the collapse of trade lens because this is a collaboration. Trade lens is a collaboration between Musk and IBM. Was a global hyperledger public blockchain platform designed to flow flow the flow of cargo from source to destination. It connected. Various parties involved in shipment, 
fostering through information sharing, collaboration, and trust. The platform aims to increase visibility for shippers regarding the status, location, and contents of the consignments. Indeed, TradeLens achieved a very product market fit. Their claim was to be neutral and open. However, the market pursued them primarily as a Musk product. Freight forwarders in particular harbored doubts about trade lines in terms of trust. This perception hindered its adoption as an independent platform. When we look at the trade lines, they are simultaneously pursued two objectives. One is building a data platform and developing a suit application on top of it. Unfortunately, this dual focus created an underlying conflict impacting industry trust. Uh, while blockchain technology is integrating, many believe that more effective, cost-effective, cost-efficient, and scalable technological solutions are exist. So while trade lens was closely tied to blockchain technology, trade parties afraid of new technology investments. I would like to mention that too many in the industry agree that electronic bill of lading will play a crucial role in digitizing the trade finance industry. And we will certainly see new digitization in solutions in logistics side, either on block blockchain technology or other technologies. We can easily draw this insight from Digital Container Shipper Association and BIMCOM's commitment to accelerate e-bill accelerate e of leadings 100% uh, by 2030. Uh, my experience uh, with uh, Marco Polo is the second uh, fintech. Marco Polo established on R3's quarter framework and uh, their aim was to simplifying and speeding up process behind open account trade finance services. And it success successfully signed up more than four, uh, 30 banks as members, including each bank from Turkey. However, pro progress was slower than anticipated. And despite, despite many efforts, Marco Polo Network was shared in February 2023. When we come to contour, contour a platform established by consortium of leading banks like BNP Paribas, HSBC, and Standard Chartered Bank. The platform, which run on R3's, R3's core the platform, enabled banks and corporates to issue, manage, and process letter of credits electronically. Despite its advantages and the value it provided, Contour again faced challenges in attracting a sufficient user base to its pl uh, platform. Ultimately, due to the, its inability, inability to raise sufficient funds from its bank share, shareholders, Contour was compelled to terminate its service in October 2023. Now, uh, I want to delve into the challenges drawing from insights gained from my uh, experiences with Marco Polo Network and Contour. Uh, the first one is uh, absence of legal frameworks. Uh, this is a big challenge for fintechs because trade and trade finance inter uh, industry have been relying on papers in the sense of sales contracts, trade documents, and trade finance operation processes. We don't have a widely accepted legal frameworks like military to conduct transactions based on these trade records. And fintech companies are very helpful uh, facilitators in enabling the transition to uh, digitization uh, because they are known for with their agility and flexibility in adopting new technologies compared to traditional banks. However, the lack of local and internationally accepted legal structures for digitization in conjunct conjunction with international agreement 
is a real uh, obstacle for scalability of these uh, fintechs because this uh, lack of uh, legal frameworks uh, creates two challenges for uh, blockchain fintechs in my view the first one is related to onboarding of new entrants uh, because at the end of the day fintechs should have its legal base in a private law framework in my experience i have seen that banks and corporates who want to join the networks have to sign so many papers to be accepted and this process takes long time and requires blockchain technology familiar lawyers this is a big obstacle for onboarding process the second one maybe more important than the first one is related to the transferability of the transaction records outside the network for example a company member or a corporate uh, member of blockchain uh, based supply chain platform cannot transfer a bill of lading or invoice or a bill of exchange to a bank that 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 does not belong to the same platform this is a really major barrier to the smooth flow of trade data as a result in my experience it's almost funny that in the quest to eliminate paper-based trade we end up signing more paper and as a solution I guess we need adoption of military and we need internationally signed agreements on this issue. Now, the second one in my view is absence of digital internationally, internationally accepted digital identities and uh, reliable methods. Uh, this is a big uh, uh, challenge for uh, scalability of the uh, blockchain uh, fintechs. Uh, in reliable methods, indeed, such as token based and distributed ledger based systems, not necessitate digital signatures. Because if a reliable method is used to identify a person and to indicate that person's intention related, with information in the DIT, the functional equivalence of signature will be met on the system. Yes, these issues really consume a lot of time and resources, but also hinder scalability of fintechs and the whole industry. I, I am sure that in the near future, we will see uh, legal entity identifiers uh, and international collaborations on this area together with sandbox trials backed by regulators for reliable systems by accepting the military uh, in country levels. Also, we don't uh, forget the complexity of the trade industry. Uh, the trade industry really... Uh, presents a formidable challenge due to the uh, it is inherent uh, complexity each sector has numerous variations making making it difficult to standardize uh, processes moreover companies exhibit vary, varying levels of readiness particularly in terms of mindset and hindering smooth transactions in trade and trade finance there are too many stakeholders. And while blockchain technology addresses trust issues among, among these parties, it also introduces some complexities in achieving harmonious collaboration. And I guess Tradelands is a good example of trust problem between parties. Uh, I'm very confident that with the assistance of AI, and common international trans standards, we can overcome these challenges and pave the way for successful supply chain blockchain fintechs. We just need more time and experience together with uh, standardization and regulatory uh, things. Uh, before digitizing trade and supply chain flows, achieving international standards is also crucial 
While trade documents share similar features and data fields, consensus on digital standard design these areas remains limited to uh, specific trade regions or sectors. For instance, every country has its own invoice standards. At the international level, there is no universal consensus on invoice formats yet. Another example from the standards, uh, uh, from the view of standards, can be come from logistics sector. Let's say Rotterdam port may not accept the same standards with port of China or port of Istanbul in Turkey. We should keep in mind that some importer countries also strategically use paper-based trade documents as a policy tool to protect their local industries from competition with countries that have a competitive advantage. As a result, without standard, it is impossible to communicate more than 5,000 trade data fields. And ICC DSI is digital standard initiative doing very good jobs in this area. The fifth one is resistant from trade stakeholders. This is also one of the reasons of the uh, collapse of the uh, blockchain as fintechs because numerous inefficiencies block supply chain flows, many streaming from century old a legacy of paper based trust and reliance on current uh, intermediaries who profit from these outdated structures. And I see that especially operation and IT units within these companies perceive for further technology investment as unnecessary in the short to medium term. In addition, supply chain intermediaries entrenched, entrenched in the legacy of the existing systems are reluctant, reluctant to digitize uh, trading processes. So we need more training, patience, and maybe incentives from governments for digitization. In my experience, I also uh, see that cloud infrastructure is a, uh, another um, challenge for uh, digitization, digitization because each country's regulatory body are meticulous about safeguarding trade data and often prohibit sharing such data on cloud servers located in other countries. Consequently, especially banks have been patiently awaiting legal regulations that allow them to utilize cloud-based storage abroad. And blockchain technology inherently demands substantial storage capacity, which is where cloud technology becomes very crucial. However, without international agreements specifically addressing the protection of the trade data, embarrassed cloud-based storage abroad remains a significant challenge, one that consumes really considerable effort during the onboarding processes. What are the main takeaways? The LT are still seen as expensive and inflexible compared to existing traditional solutions still. And still, the uh, LT or blockchain is not seen as a trustable technology because of absence of legal framework and control mechanisms. And uh, interoperability and scalability is a problem because of absence of the standards and digital identities not written yet. Now I want to talk about uh, Turkey uh, and utilization of blockchain technology in the end-to-end -end export transactions. Uh, since 2019, Turkey has been experiencing blockchain technology. First of all, I want to talk about blockchain Turkey platform. It is an independent non-profit organization. I have been continuing to take active roles in activities of Blockchain Turkey since it was founded. Our vision is to establish a sustainable blockchain ecosystem in Turkey. 
and we expanding both awareness and use of blockchain technology by set up a bridge between lawmakers, public bodies, regulators and private sector entities. Uh, this is a really very good platform to collaborate on it. Uh, on the other hand, in Turkey, banks have an entrepreneurial spirit to go digital. In trade finance uh, blockchain uh, landscape, First comers are local banks of Ishbanks and Akbank. Uh, Ishbank went to live with Marco Polo Network and Akbank went to live with WeTrade in trade finance industry. These are really very valuable experiences for our sector. In governmental level, on the other hand, uh, we finished a uh, project on blockchain which is uh, also used uh, um, hyperledger fabric uh, this this project is very value, valuable uh, um, findings uh, present us very valuable findings the purpose of the project is to demonstrate the impact of the features of blockchain technology on export processes when used together with smart contracts these effects include transparency, ease of inspection, uh, and the creation of an environment of trust to facilitate export. Uh, in the project, uh, considering actions of all stakeholders, a private and permissioned blockchain network was created in accordance with governance model via Hyperledger Fabric. Uh, we uh, experienced two types of export processes in the uh, project. Firstly, uh, export of electric bicycle to European Union via road transportation was examined. Secondly, export of Cologne to the United States of America via air transport transportation is done on hyperledger fabric and stakeholders are exporters Minister of Trade, Exporters Associations, Custom Broker, Freight Company, Bank, Insurance Company, and Agent of Shipping Company. We have too many stakeholders. Uh, project scope starts with the creation of e invoice by the exporter on Turkish Revenue Administration's digital platform and ends with the goods leaving to the Turkish border. What are the steps of the project? Firstly, the project study started with the current process analysis and stakeholders who perform transaction, transaction in the process were identified in order to create the governance model. Then uh, be, uh, the detection of bottlenecks and the weak points with operational flow in the existing system determined. After that, new flow and processes were modeled for the implementation of hyperledger fabric technology. Uh, and after all these processes, the software development and blockchain network configuration uh, started. Upon the completion of the software development processes, the operability of the applications was tested in test scenarios. What are the findings? Uh, when we look at the main findings of the project, firstly, when transactions made with blockchain, it is observed that work steps reduced by approx approximately 40%. Why? The reasons are below. Uh, reduction of paper-based pro procedures are used. Uh, and performing transactions only with data make really huge uh, difference compared to paper. And it also calls to shortening processes and facilitating uh, export and also accelerating processes through smart contracts. Contracts is possible. And uh, also, maybe more importantly, Eliminating of repetitive data sharing in the export processes is um, possible in the uh, project. 
uh, we see that also um, increasing cooperation between stakeholders because data data is flowing with smart contracts and automatically nobody uh, uh, fight while preparing the uh, papers. Uh, this also uh, strengthening the data security and trans tra uh, traceability. The second finding is it is determined that uh, controls on large data sets of customs declarations and e invoices have reduced the use of smart contracts. In case of uh, continuity of the project, a review of the data models is strongly advised in this sense. Overall, these findings confirm the impact of blockchain use on the optimization of operational processes. It is really very nice uh, findings in the sense of uh, blockchain. In Turkey also, we have been working on military project. Uh, as T3I, uh, we uh, completed a project for Republic of Turkey Ministry of Trade and European Bank. The name of the project is Supporting Digital Trade in Turkey Through Legal Reform. Uh, to develop what is the uh, objective, uh, our objective is to develop a business case, case for amending the local legislative framework to align with military. This involves conducting desktop research, interviews and surveys with the related local and international stakeholders to obtain relevant data which can be used to identify the economic benefits of legal alignment with the military. We did firstly qualitative and structured interviews with financial sector and businesses to see scale of the market and its growth and to validate secondary research on current market conditions. Then, as a second step, we did a market survey with a large sample of to give uh, estimation on magnitude of the opportunity from a bottom-up perspective. Next step was triangulation of first and second step above with the approach to estimate the proportion of the market that is most suitable to trade asset distribution. Then, from the results of the survey, we estimate trade growth, efficiency, savings, and cost improvements with other economic variables included as appropriate. What are the, our main findings? Uh, we concentrated three pillars, cost, productivity, and growth. As you may see, 7% net cost improvement for businesses and 24% uh, improvement for banks, we see this effect on cost sides. At the productivity side, when we look at the business side, uh, the Productivity gain assumption can be 21% and lower estimate of the growth is about 25% if less time spent on finance from survey. Uh, effects of 25% growth over survey will amplify it over time as efficiencies and productivity improvements take effect. As you may see, really the, uh, the the proportions are not low, very good in the sense of uh, growth and uh, productivity. When we concentrate on the uh, export uh, potential of the Turkey, potential export growth can be uh, done two third higher higher by twenty thirty, and we are expecting from our survey. Uh, 57 billion extra trade by 2030 and uh, in Turkey exports are forecast on current trend to grow by 5% uh, annually to uh, 2030 
with 25% growth assumed over time period, this adds another three annually to growth. And we are expecting that the fastest growth is towards the end of the time period will of, of course increase. Concluding remarks, 83% uh, of banks say that legislation is a barrier to trade digitization. And 87% of banks say a change in legislation will accelerate adoption. There are material benefits that are evident from the results. A change in the legislation is seen as a foundation. And lastly, I want to share with you the comparison of the other studies uh, done in uh, other countries. Similar studies are done in UK, uh, Commonwealth, and G7. And as you may see, uh, Turkey uh, has similar results with UK and uh, G7. Uh, Commodity uh, Commonwealth study also similar results, but there are too many different type of countries in Commonwealth uh, area, like Canada or uh, Morocco. These kind of uh, things, uh, different kind of countries make um, the big uh, cause the bigger interval from uh, sixteen percent to uh, forty five percent in uh, growth side. At, at Cost size in Turkey, uh, in business side, uh, 7%, bank side, 25% improvement uh, expecting. Uh, in UK uh, study, cost improvement is 25%. And uh, G7, it is also differentiate between 7 and 25%. Thank you very much for listening to me. Uh, it was a great uh, talking uh, maybe we can talk uh, each other uh, about the uh, my findings and now i am very <laughs> in dark <laughs> let me <laughs> is there a blackout there yes okay, in yeah. turkey yes yeah. evening night uh, times <laughs> while i am uh, right. presenting yeah, that's, Meryl, thank you so much. That that was fascinating. I really learned a lot from that. And, and thank you. Thank you, Ihan, for introducing and inviting Meryl to come and join us. I, um, I'm hoping you have time for some question and answer. And I imagine that other people have questions as well. I'd like to go back. You you spoke about the blockchain Turkey platform 2019 with the two types of uh, digitized import export tracking the electric bikes and the cologne and that transactions made with blockchain reduced work steps by 40 percent how what was the response on the side of the importing countries to that and was there an increase seen in demand for that type of digitization yes good question the the all the ex, ex, exercises or experiences are at the export side because mm -hmm. we try to do import side, but we need a country that have a same vision, and also we need some kind of international agreements that mm -hmm. data is equivalent to paper. Because of these uh, obstacles. Uh, last year, we uh, tried uh, export side, but with acceptance of adopting of military in Turkey, let's say we will transact with Singapore because they are accepted military. Let's say we can transact with uh, UK, mm -hmm. Germany. We are preparing for uh, this kind of uh, digital agreements, digitalization agreements. Then, mm -hmm. uh, most probably, it would be in handbags, firstly, mm -hmm. in government levels, because there are too many things that we should uh, compose digital identities, cloud issues, e signature issues, blah, blah, mm -hmm. blah. There are 
things. Uh, so we are waiting these uh, developments for import side. Okay, thank you. That's what people understand. I have a hundred question, Jeff, Andrea, Ling, who else would like to ask it speaking of questions? I had one question. Um it's, it's it's maybe a more broad based questions, but you mentioned about standardization of uh, bill ladings, invoices, the problem standardizing those. So my question comes back to um, I always made an assumption that those weren't actually stored on chain. They were stored off chain in a smart contract enabled you to point to that document. So if they're stored off change, is there ever a need? I guess what is the need to try and worldwide standardize a building or an invoice if they're not stored on chain? So there can be an electronic mm -hmm. copy that's signed cryptographically that somebody has access to and they would have to read it just like they do today. It would be digital. But what is what is the technical need, I guess, to in, to standardize invoices? Is it a technical need or is it something else around that topic? Invoice is important, I guess. Why? Uh, in, you may know uh, two two invoices using have been using in international trade. One is mm -hmm. export side, export country in general. Export countries exporter using right invoice. When we, when in the import country, when uh, the goods uh, go to the customs of the importers to pay less tax, custom tax, uh, they are using a second paper invoice in general. In sometimes we are seeing this. So the two types of the uh, invoices and uh, absence of the standards cause a lot of tax uh, tax uh, um, evasion oh, avoidance yes. avoidance yes. avoidance or evasion yes you're right even uk documents say that they have a huge uh, leak in tax uh, area because no digital data paper uh, invoices and especially SMEs using this as a tool. Uh, so yes, ah, often okay. mm. is a yeah. We can use invoices in off chain, but since it is not standard, you cannot use uh, robots capture right places in the document. This is a problem because not standard. And I, I guess um, it is deliberately not standard until uh, these days. Uh, paper is not working, it will not work, I believe, because blockchain technology or digitalization um, is a huge uh, opportunity for the governments to collect more tax and to manage more appropriate way their trade policies uh, so i believe that it should be on chain uh, but this is a revolution uh, not a revolution yet yeah, a kind of evolution it the first step uh, step jeff i believe that uh, icc dsi working mm -hmm. on standards uh, paper standards also because data record uh, records trade records cannot be lived alone today uh, we we are coming from paper world and it will always take time uh, the standards i feel that i guess that will be used for both on chain or uh, off chain paper uh, invoices or other documents okay. and the, on chain documents and the new uh, fintechs are coming, I believe, that mm -hmm. after uh, 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 winter. Thank you. I hope I give uh, the right answer to your question. Yeah, I'm... I just that's because yeah. I know it's expensive to store those documents on chain, so it drives up the cost of using DLT technology, then. So I was wondering what's in the middle there. Okay. Yeah. 
Also, cloud is really very big problem. In Turkey, regulatory bodies uh, did not like third countries uh, clouds. Oh, not only hosting. Turkey. Oh. Yes, not mm -hmm. only Turkey. All of the countries are very uh, careful on this issue. Mm -hmm. That's also a huge issue with China. Anyone doing trade yeah. with China? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Salim, so, it looked like you uh, had a question. Yes, uh, please. Uh, thank you, Manuel, for, and uh, thank you, Alicia. I have a question regarding the e bill of lading. It's a title of property. It's a very, very sensitive document. And then uh, for the banks, how they could they will be able to authenticate it once they receive it uh, under a letter of credit. As you have mentioned, that there may be a number of platforms and the banks may need to be part of the platform to be able to authenticate such a document, which is important also when it has to transmit it to the issuing bank or whatever under a documented credit. And I have also a question regarding the MLETR. Uh, when is it expected to be applied or to be, to be adopted in Turkey? And same a question for Alicia in the States. Mm -hmm. Yes. And the adoption <laughs> process, because it's the legislative and it's the base, the the adoption of the MLTR to, to push this. Watch business. out for what you give us feedback, Alicia. This yeah. is sensitive information. It certainly is. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Alicia, uh, yes. New York, I in New York. And I'm in New York. I guess 11 uh, states, you are very good in military adopting military. <laughs> I, I didn't know that. All states are uh, accepted I, as far as I remember. Really? I'll have to look into that because right now I don't know. I was not familiar with military until you had mentioned it during our email. So I had to look it up to learn more. Yeah. Um, in terms of national legislation in this country, it's very slow in coming. There is a congressional workforce around blockchain and digitization. A few years ago, I was hearing from them regularly. Recently, I'm not hearing as much. Um, so I, I unfortunately don't have a good answer for you on that. I'm sorry. The thing I can add on that is, um, let's make sure I don't get in trouble here. Um, <laughs> I do help the Federal Reserve, the Federal Reserve, um, bank in the US on some technology items. And um, the Federal Reserve is very big in the United States about going to a digital dollar and essentially getting rid of money, cash. Um, and you can see some of the things that come along the lines from regional legislation around getting rid of cash in the US. Essentially, they're going to start charging people to use cash. Um, what's happened with that is the Federal Reserve is not part of the US government it is a private entity. And um, the U.S. government has sued the Federal Reserve twice to stop some of its digitization because they thought it was too fast. And so things have slowed down the U.S. around digitization because of this tampering down idea of using a digital dollar as our main currency between all transactions um, and charging 5% roughly to, you, to give somebody money. So um, that has had a deadening effect across um digitization in the u.s on many areas because of that lawsuit there's actually two lawsuits i can't tell which ones they are but that's what's going on right now and it's not much in the media but between the federal reserve who controls our currency and the fed and the government it's, they're separate but really um, good point thank you jeff that's stopping stuff a lot I want to be mindful of time. I know, Meryl, you, you still want to answer Salim's question. And then we have one more question from so Meli, Mela. So let's, let's, Meryl, why don't you answer Salim's question? And then we'll go to Mela. And Salim, Salim's first question regarding, we should maybe a few words say, Salim. You asked the, uh, auto, uh, the authentication uh, of the EBL. Uh, by how the banks would be able uh, to authenticate these documents that they would be transmitted yeah. to them electronically. Yeah. The, I, I really leave uh, this problem when I was working for Contour. Uh, Contour uh, is uh, 
has a flow uh, for digitization of the letter of credit and uh, bill of lading is the main uh, part of this uh, product as you know uh, it was really big problem and uh, uh, without uh, onboarding a uh, e bill of lading platform it is not possible and at the end of the day, we use papers, digitally signed or PDF papers, which are uploaded by the um, exporters. And we need uh, also a, um, approval of the platform. And since we can't enable this, the scalability is not enabled. This is really a big problem of the fintechs in this area uh, I saw this really maybe I can say a few words in this issue but we are not hearing you right. you are mute yeah. I have when you approach to the customs you need to print out you need to stamp and you have to sign it and present it to the customs Forget the rest of the work, and I would like to. <laughs> and let let me give you the words to Meli. Meli has a problem. Has a uh, question. Meli, yes, it's yes. your turn. Please rise. Yeah, I didn't question. know we were time restricted, but I um, just wanted to make a small remark on. Um, I'm not sure if we talked about a military adoption in the U.S. or like any kind of legislative project, but um, I don't know if the group talked about the UCC Article 12. Um, um, which is in the new UCC and which is on uh, electronic transferable records. I don't know if this article captures um, documents of titles. I have to check that, but um, I'm working on the payment side and, and I know that UCC Article 12 definitely um, allows um, for electronic payment intangibles, which can work um, just like um, uh, negotiable instruments, which are also used in, in, in trade. So maybe that's like a, an interesting topic also for the group. Thank you. Um, if you have more suggestions or if, you, or if you want to come and lead a conversation on that in a, in a later meeting, that would be great. So um, we, ha we have regular meetings every other Thursday at this time. So yeah, uh, sure. please do, yeah, please do let us know if you want to, to get involved on that. That would be really helpful. Will do. Thank you. Will do. Okay. I want to be mindful. It's just after 1 p.m. New York time. So it's, um, so we've reached the hour. I want to be mindful of Meryl's time. Um, so I had one more question. No, also, uh, uh, some my, just asked, yeah. No, no, it, it has been cut uh, in my chat. Uh, okay. My, to, to Meryl, I mean, when does she expect this law be adopted by the Turkish parliament, the MLETR? Because it's not something which is easy. And what I heard uh, some days ago from the International Chamber of Commerce in Paris, that up to today date, we have only eight countries in the world which have adopted this law. And uh, they expect that in two years' time, 100 countries should adopt it. So what's the present status in Turkey? Also? Yes, the present state is Turkey's uh, Turkey, yeah. Sorry. but it's so the economic impact. And G7, G20 have been preparing very much keenly on military and all trade corridors necessitate to adopting military. I cannot say it at home, but we should do this change for our uh, sake of international trade volume, it will change a lot our operational processes. Uh, but we need a lot of stakeholders in local sites. There are too many universities, um, justice ministry, changing commercial law. These are and the regulatory control mechanisms also uh, another problem. One, I don't know, but two or three years I'm expecting. I can, it is my personal view. 
the marrow, if you run for parliament and you get in the Turkish parliament, then you can help push this along. <laughs> Accelerate the process. <laughs> I can't vote, but I'll do. Yeah. We we can't vote there, but yeah, we can support you however we want. Let us I know how out. we can support I you. Ihan, Ihan will vote for you. Ihan, we go. should go together. Uh, please, you should also come with me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, certainly. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's a little bit after after the hour. So again, I just want to thank you so much for Meryl for coming and sharing your research and sharing what you're doing. I know I've learned a lot. I think everyone else has as well. And Ihan, thank you for facilitating this, for making the introduction. And it's, bringing my, it's, it's, it's my pleasure. And I'm so much pleased to see the Meryl here in our community and presenting her views with us. And they, these are so much valuable. I believe it that. And yeah. they, and the uh as the always andrea said it's the evolution time not the revolution yeah. and the, my motto is bye bye paper at the end mm -hmm. <laughs> remember data not paper this is the man i i i, I, I like bye bye paper <laughs> <laughs>